If you are dating online, listen up to Maddie's first meeting, date, and subsequent dates because she didn't set herself up very well. And it's understandable not to when you think, oh, I'm not really going to like this guy. But what happens to us so many times is that despite what you think in the beginning, it can happen. Once in her relationship, Maddie is falling prey to her subconscious programming about pleasing. She talks about very openly, which I really like, her fear that if she doesn't give over to what Andrew wants in the moment, she will lose him forever. And you see, it is the fear that she must get over. It's fear itself, not really what's happening with Andrew. And we talk about that at the end of this episode. It's so important that you'll listen through to the end to get that nuance. Don't thwart your learning. Listen through to the end and you will get a lot from Maddie. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Will He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. My guest today is 56-year-old Maddie. Maddie and 46-year-old Andrew met online and have been together about three and a half years, but with four breakups during that time. Maddie wants to know from me how to keep from having recurrent breakups and reconcile with Andrew for good. Welcome, Maddie. Hello. So I want to get into these four breakups that you had and where you are now. But I find it interesting to start by asking you, what do you think if you could put like one word or one label on it as to why you have had so many breakups, what immediately comes to your mind? I have thought about this a lot, obsessively thought about it, and I I don't have an answer. Andrew is very conflict averse. And I think in his mind, everything has to be perfect all the time, or it's time to abandon it. But I I don't know. And how about from your end, if I said, okay, you need to take some responsibility, what would be on your end? What would come to mind? What do you think he thinks or you feel would be maybe your part in it? I have asked him. He doesn't give me an answer. I am more needy than he is, but I think my needs are, I think my needs are reasonable. Okay. That's a good start. And we're going to unpack that. So I want to go back to when you first met and started just Give us the thumbnail sketch of meeting online, getting to the first date, and how it went from there, and how long until the first breakup. Okay. So we met online um, about three and a half years ago. We chatted online for a little bit. He pushed for an in-person meeting, and I was kind of hesitant. I wasn't sure if I was found him appealing or not. He's quite funny, so I enjoyed that, but I was a little hesitant. But I finally decided, what the hell, I've got the day off. I'll just meet up with him. So we met in the park, and he brought food, and I brought alcohol. Okay, so I met him, and I was not attracted to him. He was wearing flip-flops and a ratty T-shirt, and I just thought to myself, well, I just need to get through through this meeting, and then I can be done. And At the end of the meeting, and he was funny, but at the end of the meeting, we 
but I think he might have kissed me. I can't remember, but he was a good kisser. So that was meeting one. Okay. Meeting one wasn't optimal because the park, you bringing alcohol, and you may have questioned, well, why would that be a problem? Or do you know now why it would be an issue for anyone? And I'm doing this aside from you, Maddie, because for those listening, do you know why I would say not to do that? Yes. What do you think about it? Why? You would say to make him work for it, to definitely not drink, which we did not. I mean, we had half a cocktail apiece. But you would say to make him work for it. But I chose that meeting because I didn't think I was going to like him and I didn't want him to spend money on me if I wasn't going to like him. Ah, I'm so glad you answered like that because it opens up this conversation a bit. In online dating, before we meet somebody, we have to think what's going to set it up in a way that does two things. The first is to put us in the right category to be a potential Mrs. Right. Because you don't know if you will like him. And most of the time, I would say, with online dating, you don't see him as a Prince Charming right off the bat. I mean, nine times out of 10, it's not going to be that. And it's going to be just like what you thought early on. I don't think I'm going to really go for him, but I've got the time. I'll just do it. And it's not the best way to set ourselves up for getting the man the most interested he can be in the right way. So, for example, we don't ever meet for coffee. We don't meet in a park. We don't show ourselves to be low value in that way. But we also don't go to dinner or any expensive date like that where we're caught for a good deal of time. Okay? Again, there's one time. It's a perfect time for meeting and it is the perfect place and that's in my one love self-help course you get exactly where to go exactly the time exactly how to set it up with him in a feminine way but we don't go to a place like a park because it immediately not only could it be unsafe but it sets us up not to be pursued if we want something later here's the other thing bringing alcohol to it kind of just mm, adds insult to injury because you're showing possible in a park, it sends a wrong message because you brought it. If he brought it, you might just take a sip or two, but you bringing it sends the wrong message. And here's the thing. You are so lovely and so sweet. You want to be nice for him not to spend any money if you don't like him. That is from your programming and we need to get rid of that because that will hurt you. I have a saying that we as women hurt ourselves with three little words. One's a contraction, I know. We're too nice. He can buy you a drink in order to meet you. And if he doesn't, well, that should be the last meeting. You see, what do you think about that? I understand that is actually water under the bridge and I did the first kind of date we went on he asked me to split and it was at Denny's and I split it with him because I make a lot more money than he does but the last time we reconciled since we reconciled the last time I have not paid for anything other than I've got us some tickets for his birthday nothing not a coffee not a drink not a meal nothing okay I understand where you're coming from. I'm giving you this for future should you decide you don't want Andrew at the end of the day, but we're going to work towards that. But for everyone else listening, second of all, when he says he wants to meet again and you decide to go, you don't want to go to Denny's because again, you're showing him how you value your time and him choosing something like that and then he added to it by saying split it it just doesn't set you up and again this for you is all water under the bridge but this podcast is for everyone to learn from and know what will help you because here's the difference if 
you went to a nice restaurant on that first meeting. It would have helped you feel something different or a little bit more. But the most important thing is that he shows you who he is. Because I'm not so sure that how it started didn't impact his feeling right from the get-go. We'll see. But it's just some food for thought. And anybody listening, again, go to the One Love Self-Up course, get it, and you will save yourself a lot of not-so-great meetings and dates. So let's get back to you, Maddie, and how things went from there and how it came to the first breakup. Okay, so I wasn't that keen on him, but he pursued me. I had nothing else going on in my life. I was, you know, I guess bored. So we decided to meet up for a walk in the park again. But I still I still was not really interested. I was it was on my way home from work and I was like, eh, might as well. Might as well get some attention. So we went for our walk in the park again. He's um, texting me a lot. He's complimenting me a lot. He's not love bombing me, but you know, minor early stages of love bombing. You know, you're so great. I like you so much. He keeps asking me out and I keep saying no because I'm just not very interested. So he asked me, you know, do you want to go for a sunset beach walk? No, I'm busy. Then he's like, do you want to go on Sunday for a motorcycle ride? No, I can't. Well, um, what do you think about maybe going to the gun range? And I'm like, hell yeah, I would love to go to the gun range. Not because I liked him, but because I wanted to go on the gun range. And so he said, this was during COVID. So he says, I need to see if they're open, you know, what their hours are and what their kind of restrictions are because of COVID. And I said, okay. And I'm not exactly sure how the next part happened, but I was dropping my sister at the airport and he said, my sister was in town. He said, hey, I know your sister's leaving today. Do you want to go to the gun range if it's open or meet up for coffee if it's not? And I thought to myself, well, okay. I met up with him for coffee. Gun range was was open, but you had to make kind of reservations because of the COVID thing. Like you couldn't just show up. And so we met for coffee and he said, I'm going to work on my motorcycle today. Do you want to come help? And I said, yeah, I think that would be interesting. So I went to his house. We did not work on his motorcycle and we were making out on the couch and I ended up having sex with him. And I the thing is, I, wasn't, I still wasn't even attracted to him, but I thought, well, I kind of felt sorry for him. I thought, well, he probably hasn't had sex in a long time, and well, I haven't had it in a while, so what the hell, I may as well. And I did. But it was pity sex, literally pity sex. I had no interest in sort of continuing this relationship at all. Okay. So what I said about being nice, you are truly very, very nice, pity sex. And there's also something else here for you to truly think about for yourself, that it's not pity sex the way we might think of it. It's you feeling like you owe him something at that moment and not feeling okay to not give him that. And this is programmed likely in you, and again, from your earliest days on the earth, that you need to be pleasing and not just a man in how we think of it today, but because a man embodies your love interests, which are your parents from your programming, it's pleasing to get love, attention, affection. And it's morphed into a bit of that because he showed you true interest. You didn't have to do anything to continue his interest, and you didn't have the interest to do it. So you really just want to think about that for yourself, because when that changes, everything can change. Now, again, water under the bridge, but because this is a teaching tool for everyone, I want everyone to think about that, because it's afterwards that we deal with the effects of it. And Many times, because of the way we bond, we can be bonding with someone even not really right for us. 
in a sense, out of that feeling of obligation. So just something for every woman to think about. And thank you, Maddie, for allowing me to go off on that tangent. So back to you. Now you, okay, have sex. How do things go from there in your relationship, making the relationship, and how long until the first breakup? So I guess I decided I liked him pretty well. And we started seeing each other fairly regularly. Sometimes it was just a a walk in the park. Sometimes it was just hanging out. Sometimes it was watching a movie, whatever. And so he said to me at some point something, and I don't know what it was because I can't remember, but he said to me something that made me think that he would never let me spend the night at his house. And then a few weeks, months went by, and he asked me to sleep over, and I did. So we're going along. I think everything's fine. I'm falling for him big time. I think he feels the same. And lo and behold, he matches with one of my friends on Tinder. Now, we hadn't had an exclusivity talk. I sort of assumed we were. It hadn't come up. So he texted me in the morning, as he always has. Good morning. How did you sleep? Blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, I found something out last night that I'd rather not know. And so I didn't sleep very well. So he's like texting, calling me and texting me, and I'm not, I'm just not picking up. I'm just, I'm upset. I have to work. I'm just not in the correct space. And so I'm like, I can't, we can talk about it later. I just can't talk right now. So I go to work and I do my work stuff and I get off about noon and I text him. I have a few minutes. I can come over now if you want to talk. Okay, come over. So I go to his house. I'm on my way from one job to another. So I go to his house, and I walk in, and I say, you know, I get that we never had any sort of exclusive talk, but you matched with a friend of mine on Tinder, and that I don't really understand that. If you don't want to be exclusive, that's great. I'll go ahead and date other people, but I need to know. And I was pretty matter of fact. I wasn't super upset about it. There may have been a little sniveling, but I was like, hey. You know, just, just be straight with me. And that, we had an exchange I love you or anything. So it was pretty early in the, in the thing, probably a couple of months in. And he says, no, no, no. I want to be exclusive. You're the only person I want to see. I don't know why I did it. He had made a date with her. And then, like the day of the date, he had matched her. So I don't, I don't think he intended on meeting her. So that happened. So we decided, I said, well, so if we're exclusive, that's fine. Let's just keep on keeping on. And we did. Things went fairly okay. I'm falling harder and harder for him. He gets COVID. Well, I'm a physician, and he's pretty, uh, pretty liberal and pretty careful. And I'm like, okay, well, we can't, you know, we can't see each other for 10 days. We can talk and stuff, but I'm not going to, I can't expose myself to that because I, I don't want to get my patients sick. And he was pretty sick. And I would do things like I would bring food and leave it on his doorstep, and I'd say, you know, I'll let you some breakfast burritos or whatever, but I I wasn't going to see him. He didn't push it. He didn't push me seeing him. And finally, after the 10 days were over, I went over there, and uh, we were still kind of like sitting our 10 feet apart, and we decided to, you know, just lay down in bed for a little while. And we laid down, and I thought he was asleep, and I said, I love you. And he goes, what? I'm like, I love you. He's like, he's like, I know what you said. I just wanted to hear it again. (laughs) And then he said it back. So we're going along, things are going great. Well, I go on vacation in November with my, and this all started in August. So I go on vacation five months later or something with my kids, my ex-husband, and my nieces. And he calls me one day and he says, I can't do this. I feel like a side disc. You're there with your family, blah, 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 blah. And I just fall apart. I'm like, don't do this. It's blah, 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 blah. And so then I go no contact. Well, no contact for four days. I get back in town and I text him. I'm like, hey, can you do me a kindness? I'd like to talk to you. There's some things that I don't think you understand. So I called him and I said, hey, I was on vacation with my family. This was bought long before I met you. This was planned long before we knew each other. And I had a separate hotel room. I wasn't staying with my ex. Like I was doing things with my kids and my nieces. And of course, it ruined my fucking vacation that he broke up with me on vacation. But I didn't tell him that. I'm like, so, you know, do what you will, but I think you need the information to make a decision. And he's like, yeah, he's like, the minute I hung up, I knew it was a big mistake and let's 
continue. So I went to his house and we talked for like an hour or so. And then I just went on home. I was tired. You know, it was just exhausting. And I was tired. So that was breakup number one. And it was four days. So that was about five months in? Yeah, four or five. Okay. How did it go from there? Okay. So I think we're pretty devoted. He does need a lot of space. He is very closed off. I try to get him to share, you know, emotional things with me. And he just has a very difficult time to do that with doing that. He does tell me he loves me. He does tell me he adores me. He's very love bomby, very affectionate, very physically affectionate when we're together. I mean, just he cannot be in the same room with me without having some kind of physical contact. A foot on me, a hand on my shoulder, hold up, whatever. So we're going along and things are, I think things are great. And come along about um, 11 months into the relationship and he calls me and he says, he's crying. And I'm like, what's wrong? Did something happen to your mom? Are you okay? And he says, I just can't do this anymore. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What pictures do you mean? And he says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And I say, well, you know, I want to be with someone that's in love with me. I want to be, you know, with someone that feels that way. What happened? I don't understand. You were telling me you love me this morning. Don't get it. He's like, I don't know, but it has to be this way. So I say, well, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So he hangs up. So I'm just devastated, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let him know that. So I go about my business. We do have a hobby that we share in common. And we told one of his friends who's deeply involved in the holly, don't kick Maddie out. Let her keep attending. It's not her fault. Because his friend is kind of the, the boss of the whole thing. And so four days later, he calls and then he hangs up. So I call him back. I'm like, what do you want? Or what's up? And he says, never mind, never mind, uh, uh, never mind. I'm sorry to bother you. And I say, okay, you called for a reason. What is it? And he said, well, I think I made a mistake. I think we should, you know, try to work things out. And I said, well, I'll meet you in, at the bay tomorrow after work. So we meet and we decide to go forward. And I think things are great. So then I go on vacation. I go to see my cousin with my mom and my sister in Michigan. And I'm kind of, I've been burned a few times now. So I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've been a rules girl all along. I'd make him text me three times before I'd text him back. I usually wouldn't make him call three times, but I, I sort of would make him do a little bit of work. And I kept that up. And he seemed a little butthurt on the vacation that I wasn't, you know, he'd be like, well, I, I guess you're with your family. I guess you're busy. I guess, you know, I want to talk to you, but I guess you're too busy for me. That kind of like poor little me stuff. And I sort of ignore it, but I, I talked to him. I didn't shun him or anything. And so we get back, and he comes to pick me up at the airport. And he's really pissy at the airport because it took me a long time to get out to the curb, not under my control. And he's just, like, he doesn't kiss me. I'm like, are you going to kiss me? And then he's like, oh, yeah, I guess. And he's just being pissy about it. So, you know, I haven't seen him in four days. I really want to spend some time with him. He takes me to get my van, and it's at his house. And, I'm, you know, I just, I just don't stay very long. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go home. So then it's like, you know, I love you. This is like Thursday. I love you. I miss you. I think about you all the time. Picks me up on Sunday. I think things are going okay. He's a little at the airport. Um, Monday, I love you. When can I see you again? Tuesday, I love you. I mean, and he doesn't want to see me very often either, which does not work well with my attachment style. I love you. I miss you. When am I going to see you? And then this is Tuesday morning. Good morning, sweetheart. I hope you had a good day so far. Let's talk later. And then he calls me. And He's crying again. And I'm like, what's up? What's going on? And he says, I just can't do this anymore. I don't feel the way I should. And I say, well, I deserve someone who feels the same way. So I understand that. Anyway, I've got to go. I'm at work. And then I went into no contact. But he never, he never reached out. You know, never reached out. I reached out to him 45 days later. But I didn't talk to him. I didn't talk about him. I posted on social media. And he unfriended me 21 days later. But I just... I was just not done, but I was kind of done. Okay. And was that the last breakup? And that's where you are now? No. That breakup lasted 14 months. And then what happened? I reached out to him at day 45 and just asked him for advice on a triathlon. Didn't say anything about the relationship. And about once a week or so, I might reach out and ask him something that he was interested in, something about a motorcycle, or something about a motorcycle helmet, or something that he knew about, advice to get him, you know, something that he was interested in. 
And eventually he sort of started contacting me and we sort of established a, a friendship of sorts. I was still in love with him. He was just dating and doing his thing. And I didn't mention the relationship. I didn't mention anything about it. And about six months into that, he said, we can't be friends. I know you said you would be okay with that, but I can feel you holding on and it's breaking your heart and it breaks my heart. So back into no contact I went. And I just said, hey, I'm not hurting, but if you're hurting, that's fine. Space never hurt anybody. Back into no contact. He does. And he texts me a couple of times after that, hey, how's your sister? Hey, I wish to retract my statement. We don't need the six-month break, blah, blah, blah. And I just ignore him. 45 days later, I start this whole reaching out thing again. And eventually, he starts to be more responsive and plan more things and be more engaged with me. And at one point, he decides that he's going to invite me to go to a place where a bunch of people are involving my hobby. And so we go, and I kind of snuggle up next to him, and he acts like I have, like I have burned him. He is so not there yet. And I'm like, okay. So I just kind of retract a little bit, and we kind of do this push-pull bullshit for, for months and months and months. And then one day we go for, we we're going on a weekly walk every week at his initiation. You want to go for a walk? Sure. And I never, at this point, I don't initiate anything. I let him initiate everything, texting, calling, everything. You want to go for a walk? Sure. So we go for a walk. It's like, you know, the walking club. And my friends are all like, oh, you're going for your walking club again. I'm like, yeah, well. And so... We go for a walk, and we, go, and we usually will hug goodbye, and I'll just give him a quick side hug. He grabs me, and he hugs me, and he starts stroking my hair. And I'm just like, okay. And he says, I miss you. And I say, well, of course you miss me. I'm delightful. Uh, no, Maddie, I really miss you. And I say, well, what do you want to do about it? And he says, well, I don't know. I need some time to think about it. And I say, okay. And we go back to our weekly walks. And he thinks about it for a couple of weeks, and he comes back to me, and he says, I've been thinking about it, and I got triggered because I heard you were going out with somebody else, and I think it was all out of jealousy, and I think we should just be friends. And I say, well, when weren't we friends? I mean, I don't agree to be friends with him, but I'm like, when weren't we friends? And, and the date that he heard about was just a friend, but he had me all married off to this guy. Anyway, a couple of weeks goes by, and we're just chatting because we chat almost every day, and he says, he video calls me, and I pick up the phone, and he said, Maddie. I'd really like to date again. And I say, well, I guess we could give that a try. And is that where you are now? No. <laughs> so we start dating again. And this time I, I make him, I really think that I'm making him work for it. I make him, you know, text me three or four times for everyone. And not always, but often. Sometimes I'll call him back or text him back if he asks me something that needs to be answered. He takes me on dates. He pays for everything. He buys me things. He bought me some motorcycle gloves. He bought me a coat. He, he still doesn't want to see me more than once a week or so. Or he says he doesn't want to see me more than once a week. But then he's constantly like, can you come over? Why don't you come over between work? Because I, I work two different jobs. Can we, you know, meet up, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's constant. But he says he only wants to, to meet once a week. And at some point, I tell him, we're talking about the relationship, and I, and I say to him about the future. He's like, I really like things the way they are. What about you? And I say, well, eventually I want to get married. I want to live with somebody. I want to have a life with somebody. And he says, well, I don't ever want to get married. You know, I don't want to get married to you or anybody. I'm not capable of it. I don't have that capacity. And I'm like, I think to myself, well, this is about maybe a month into our new relationship. And I think to myself, well, you know, we'll just see about that. We'll just. We'll just see, you know, we'll just, well, I'll give him a year. I'll give him a year. And if he doesn't step up, then I'm out. So things are going really great. And then every so often, and I did it four times, I would say, I, I would get upset and I'd say, I don't understand why you broke up with me before. I don't get it. Tell me what happened. You've got to tell me because I don't, I don't want it to happen again. It was very difficult for me. I did not like it. And I don't, I don't understand what happened. I flat out, I just don't understand. Can you tell me? He's like, I don't know. He's like, my feelings changed. I don't know what happened. And I'm like, it just seemed like you love me, you miss me, you want to be with me every single day, or you, you, you miss me, you think about me all the time, and then two days later, I don't love you anymore. I said, do you, do you know how that felt? Do you understand how I would be, well, a little worried about it happening again? And he's like, you have got to quit bringing this up. You have got to stop bringing this up. And I'm like, I've only brought it up four times. And he's like, it hurts me when you do this. It hurts me deeply. And you keep doing it. And I'm like, well, 
I keep not getting an answer. And, oh, by the way, buddy, you hurt me deeply too. Let's, let's not forget about that. And so he kept bringing up that I hurt him. And I'm like, look, if you can't get over me bringing this up, I won't bring it up again. But if you can't get over me bringing this up, then there's no point in us going forward. And he said, what did you say? And I said, well, if you can't get over me bringing this up, there's no point in us going forward. And so he said, you know what? I'm done. We're done. I'm done. And I'm like, wait, what? What just happened? Wait, did, did I break up with you? Did you break up? I'm so confused. So he said he was done. So I said, well, okay. He said, you can come get your stuff. I won't throw anything away. Because last time, you know, when we were apart for 14 months, he threw my teddy bear away. I didn't really have anything else there because he wouldn't give me a drawer. He wouldn't give me a house. He did give me a house at one point, but he wouldn't give me any, any space there. So I didn't really have anything there except for my teddy bear, which he threw away, which later I told him that was city move because it wasn't his to throw away. But he said, you can come get your stuff later. I'm not going to throw anything away. And I said, no, no, I would like to take all of my things now. Um, he's like, I can help you. I'm like, no, I can get it. So I've got all my stuff. I had a paddle board and I had a, I don't know. It took me about four trips to the car because we were supposed to go paddle boarding that day. And turns out that I left my guitar there. I just sort of forgot about it and some other thing. And so the next day I texted him. I don't understand what just, I'm, I'm not even sure we're broken up. I'm not even sure where we are. So I texted him, I don't understand what happened. Can we talk? Or we should talk. He texted back, no talking. I told you what happened. So I sat on it for three or four days. And then I texted him, hey, I have some things I think would be helpful for you to hear if you could be kind enough to talk to me. And so he did. And, uh, and I just said, look, I get it. You know, I kept bringing up the past. And the past is the past. And I wasn't really appreciating what we had in the present. You know, I think we had this relationship that was filled with love and respect and kindness. And I kind of lost track of that. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I did not mean to hurt you. That's, that was never my intentions. I would never hurt you. And, and it's, it's true. I wouldn't. And then, and then I said, well, okay, I just kind of wanted to get that off my chest. And he said, well, I need some more space. And I'm like, okay. So then he starts texting me. After he says he needs space, he starts texting me like 20 minutes later. And I'm like, okay. But it's nothing to do with us. It's nothing to do with the relationship. It's about his computer. And then he says he has my watch. So I sit on that. I ignore it. This is Friday. On Sunday, I text him, if you could leave my things on your porch, I'd like to come get them. You can Venmo me for the sale. And boom, if you want to keep it or trade me your skateboard, because there's a sale of mine that he wanted. Or you can just trade me stuff for it. And he said, I was going to ask if we could talk in the next few days, but I'll get your stuff together. And then he says, it's too much to leave outside. We'll have to see each other. And then he says, I said I needed a couple of days to think. Did you mean I had to say yes or no right then? And I said, of course not. You take all the time you need. I don't want to use your apartment as a storage facility, and I want my watch. And he said, I have your things organized. And then later he's like, can we talk tomorrow? And that was yesterday. Can we talk tomorrow? So he's supposed to talk to me. He's like, I'm sorry. I love you. And I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. So that's where I am right now. I suspect he will, he will reach out to me today, I suspect. He might not, but I suspect he will. Well, I'm glad we're doing this then because there are fundamentals here that you have to get and get very quickly or you will continue in this relationship as you are having it. I'm going to go back a little bit to kind of help you with that. First, I will say that you are taking certain things that he does as his indication of a love for you that is not the kind of love you are projecting it to be. For example, he pays for everything. He buys you things, gifts. We have to understand that is no indication of a man's love in the way you are interpreting it because you must take the whole of the relationship and things. For example, and I don't know if you will recollect it, but you said, because I wrote it down when you said it, he pays for everything, he buys me nice gifts, and yet he wants to see me once a week. And you see, we can justify many things because you're in it. You can't see the forest for the trees. But when we get a fundamental about men, and good men, because he's a very decent guy. And decent men, when they don't feel what they need to feel 
will keep us at bay. And because you are having sex with him and he adores you as a person, he is going to show that caring, that feeling by paying and buying you things. It means nothing about his deeper feelings for the kind of love that goes the distance. Does that make sense? That does make sense, but he also love bombs me. He constantly tells me that he adores me, that he loves me, that he misses me. I mean, it's constant. He does. hard not to fall for that. You got it. It's hard not to fall for it. The problem is several things. And we will go back to what I said initially. The way you set things up did not set you up for him getting the kind of feelings he needs to get that prompt deeper feelings. This is why how we meet someone, especially from online, and how we date is extremely important for setting them up for deeper feelings. The biggest takeaway here, which you have to hear, it's hard, is that when you were going along, you were having sex, you were seeing him, and he, even though you did not have an exclusive relationship through verbalization. He was still on Tinder and he reached out to someone that told you everything you needed to know then. And that is when it has to be done hard. And when I say done, I mean, you have to say, I was under the impression that this was, even though we did not have a talk about it, my bad, but I need to leave things here. And then you must leave it absolutely no contact. And when he comes back, which he did on one of them, I don't know which it was, he did on one of them, he called you, you weren't able to answer, and you called him back. No, it must be done that he has to scale a mountain to get you to even deign to ever see him again. When we get this in the way that a man needs it, to feel inspired for the love to be something other than companionship love, familial love, love for you as a person. Of course he does. He's not lying when he says he loves you, but he has shown you time and again, as a man, he knows the desire for you in the way a man needs to feel it is not there. You can inspire that. That's the good news. You can do this and have him back with that desire, the way it needs to be for men. We cannot understand this in any way that is experiential for us. We cannot. That's okay. We just have to know it exists and deal with the fact of it. Companionship, love for you as a person, familial love, that kind of love is not enough. And if he were to ever commit to you with that, with that kind of love, you will have heartache, problems, cheating. Does that make sense? I said, yeah, it does. I I just, I think I'm scared that he won't be able to do it. You don't have to be scared that he won't be able to do it. What you have to be scared of is you not doing it until. That's for any woman. Because I have to tell you, with everyone I work with, when she does it and does it full out, it works. In other words, here's the good news. He has that love for you. That's baseline. Fantastic. Great news. But if you continue doing things the way you're doing them, you will not inspire in the way he needs to do it. You need to do this by the book and do it until, and this has got to be absolutely because of four breakups, the make or break breakup. We are the mechanics of the relationship, the keep the relationship car on the road, heading in the right direction and getting to where we need it to go. You've abdicated that role and you've given it over to him. And it's like giving the car over to us and saying, you be the mechanic. We don't know what the hell we're doing. You can have this, but you've got to get it really fast and do it right now. If you don't, you will have exactly the same thing you have. And here's the deal. Whenever I'm at a place like this with any woman, I tell them, you need to do this. 
if you want it to be different. But if you want to continue this relationship as it is, you can have it. You can have it as it is. You made a couple of blunders along the way. For example, going back. If any of you know my work, it's a saying I have. Don't go back. When we revisit something like, what caused you to break up with me? And try to have that talk. Nothing but bad stuff is going to come out of that. You cannot. One thing that will help you immensely, Maddie, is for you to start taking 100% responsibility for being in this relationship. When you do, it's a game changer. You know that you can have what you want through one of the umbrellas under which I work, which is manifestation, working on your self-concept, getting to your programming. You know that the sun rises and sets with you in his mind. You know you can have it all, and you can. When you get your programming right, then we add in the other umbrella under which I work, which is doing what works with men. That's a lot that I just told you, and you're going to have questions, I understand. But when you know that he knows absolutely, without a doubt, how you feel about him, he wants to do right by you, he wants to be a good guy, he is drawn to you, you are his best friend, it's a huge loss for him. You can use that loss to eventually get what you want. But make no mistake, reaching out to him after 45 days, no matter what it's about, it's thinly veiled. He is caught between all that you give him and all the good stuff and the not feeling what he needs to feel to know that this can be forever and that he's doing right by you. Again, you can change this and it must be done once and for all. Well, during the last breakup, he did date someone for five months. And I asked him a little bit about it. I, I, I said, did you, did you guys care about it? Well, it came out because when we got back together, he wanted to have sex. And I said, well, you need to get tested. And he said, okay. And I thought, okay. He was with somebody else. And then he had something. So he was really with somebody else. And so I said, um, I said so how long and what, what was that, what went on in that relationship? And he said, we were together for five months. And he told me later that they cared about each other. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, we started getting close again. So, I mean, I did reach out at 45 days, you know. I, he shuts people off. I'm afraid to go completely no contact on him. I'm afraid. You're going to such the wrong solution because of your programming. This other relationship has nothing to do with the issues. You have to start working on what will be the game changer here. Because if you continue to think how you are thinking and behave the way you are behaving, you will get more of what has occurred. That's all I can tell you. I don't know what to do. I understand that. I literally don't know what to do. He's going to call me today. I don't know what to do. Okay. I can, I can desert my things. I mean, I don't need to get my stuff back. I can buy a new watch. I can, I can desert my guitar. I've got another one. That can sit there in his garage or he can throw it in the trash again. That I don't care about, but I don't know what to do. And I, I, just, I just don't have the heart not to answer the phone. I don't think I can do it. And that's because of your programming. It's because I'm scared. Yes. And he never calls again. What if, Maddie, you do this and you do it the way I'm going to outline it for you, and he never calls you again? What does that tell you? That he's gone? Yes. But I'm here to tell you that's not going to happen if you do it this way. Now, isn't that me really going out on a limb by saying that? In other words, if I didn't know that this works so well through everyone that I've worked with, having done it myself, could I say that? I've done it before and people have not come back to me. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you, it's because you didn't set it up the right way when you've done it before. Because you're thinking a certain thing, and it's not how I'm going to outline it for you. When you do it this way, and you start to up your value, and concurrently, you working on you, because there's stuff here that you've got to change for yourself, or whether it's him or somebody else that you fall for, it will be the same. You fundamentally got to change that 
along with how you do this breakup. If you don't, I know about self improvement, and I, I think I'm pretty good there. I mean, my job is fantastic. I am world ranked in my hobby. Um, I, I'm attractive physically. I'm smart. I'm successful. But I don't know. And none of that has anything to do with your programming. It is your programming, your subconscious belief program that you are running on underneath all of your intellect, all of your good looks, all of your achievement outside of this area. You see, our subconscious programming in this realm, meaning romantic love, is a separate program from when we are birth to age seven only. Now again, that age is a little fluid, but not much. It comes from a place of a theta brain state, which is what we try to get adults into when we hypnotize them. We are that suggestible and we have no experiential knowledge. We have no intellectual knowledge. We have no awareness of anything. And everything we do from birth to age seven is in an attempt to get love from two people, parental figures. And in that unknowledged state, lack of awareness state, inexperienced state, starting with no language state, we have an inner knowing as a human animal that our mere survival depends on the love of those two people. How we attempt to get that love caring attention is our programming that we continue to run on after age seven in terms of our lovability, worthiness, value, trust level, everything we do only with a love interest. In other words, there is no surprise to achievement outside of this area. There is something in your programming that is And again, you won't have necessarily awareness of this until it is brought to your attention. So there's something, again, you won't remember. You have no memory of this because your childhood for memories are a combination of what you've been told about your childhood and snippets of memory and then after seven, getting memory. But this is well before it when you have no memory because you're in a theta state. That's why we don't have memory. So there's something there whereby... You had to be something in order to get your needs met. And again, we don't know what that is that you had to be, but you felt you had to please, you had to be a certain way. And your experience of love then is what you are playing out in your adult life, again, only with love interests. In other words, you likely have great relationships otherwise, family, friends, colleagues, and This has nothing to do with anything related to your advocation, vocation, anything like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you say, I've done self-improvement, if you haven't done it in this way, you're going to continue to have that fear, not feel really worthy, because I'm going to ask you something and I want you to answer from your intellect. Why the hell wouldn't he want you? If we look at this just subjectively, why wouldn't he? That is the question, isn't it? When something doesn't make sense, you know it's coming from your subconscious. And this is why I work in the way that I work with women. So we get to that and raise it because that alone is the game changer. Because I'm not hearing, other than the breakups, you're relating in any fashion that wouldn't make it work on a day-to-day basis you see like i said i made i actually make him do the work i wanted him to be invested in me invested time money uh emotions uh work i just wanted him to to work for it because i feel like if you do all the work for them they don't value you okay you're maddie maddie you're on the right track you're just not understanding that it's you not what you want that's the issue not even asking him for those things and when i say asking i put that in quotes because you don't have to ask when you get it right he will just do it you don't know what you don't know in that respect you are right yes and he will do those things when you get right with you 
and the energy coming off of you is right so that he can absolutely know that change has been made. So he no longer feels guilt that he's doing something wrong. So he no longer feels the need. You know that you come off with him many times as needy. And this is not from your intellect and who you are. Because objectively, you just admitted, there is no reason for him not to totally love and want you. There is no reason for you to have to be needy of his love and fearful of losing it. It's all from your subconscious that this is happening. And the good news is you have control over that by feeding it the right stuff and working on it in a simple way that in a short amount of time can change your feeling deeper and in your subconscious to change that program that you're running on, which is your baby mind program of your value, your worth, and what you must do and be to be loved, to be cared for, to be safe, to be secure, to actually survive. That's how deep it is. The good news is we don't have to do deep work on it. We just have to do very pointed, for lack of a better word, exercises to get it right. And we will go into more of that and I will answer your questions about that and then get to a bit of what you must do immediately today when you say he has called, well, you say he has called you. No, he will call me. Ah. He told me he would, he will. Okay. I'm pretty, pretty well. Okay. So... It's very simple, very, very simple. And I'm going to give you that in a moment. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future in full, all ad-free. The 8020 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status, and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, Relationship Evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. So, Maddie, during the break, what were you thinking? What are your biggest questions for me? I just don't know if I have the mental fortitude to do contact on him. You don't right now. I don't know if I can refuse to talk to him today. Because you don't have a plan? You don't have an approach? You don't have a strategy? Because I'm afraid that if I ignore him if I don't talk to him when he I'm suspecting wanting to reconcile that that he will not come back to me I understand and you see when I give this approach and I'm not saying you have to go no contact I'm not saying you have to do any of this I'm saying if you do this work to change your programming if he wants to see you now you can do it but I'm going to tell you something If you don't change the programming and change fundamentally how you're interacting with him, it's going to happen again. If you change it and you do this work, this is what I do with women weekly. When you do that, you can then lead him down the road of him making the decision through the desire and the feeling that this can go the distance. And if it should happen again, you will be at a totally different level in order to do what is necessary. Because we've got to quell this and stop this way of interacting that you've had. I will tell you regardless, your fear is unfounded. 
but your fear is there because of the way you have been with him energetically. I get that. And because of your programming, of course you feel that way. You will be left. You are not going to be loved, cared for, have the affection, all of it. Of course you feel that way. You have got the control, the power, the everything you need to change this to where it needs to be so that you inspire his right kind of desire and lead him down the path towards full commitment with you no longer feeling anxious, needy, scared, unknowing, all of it. I, I didn't think I acted needy with him. I know you didn't, but you did. I specifically tried not to act needy with him. Understandable. But you see, we don't ever get past our subconscious. It leaks out all over the place. And it did in just the little bit that I heard, the verbalization, just from how you started. And I know that that wasn't even an intentional thing, but we don't set the man up to see us as valued when we don't mindfully go step by step. I know you didn't. I know you don't think you let him to believe these things. I also don't understand why this is the only relationship in my life that has been so, I don't know, on and off. I think maybe it's because I did do some no contact and I was able to reel him back, whereas previous Maddie would have cried and begged and stalked and been, you know, frankly, a crazy person when someone would leave her and so kind of would get into this, you know, there's no going, after you do certain things, after you drive by someone's house 75,000 times, there's kind of no going back. So Maddie didn't do that this time. So maybe that's what allowed it to, to go on and on and on as to just being a clean break. I'm not sure. You hit on something. You didn't do it this time, but you have not done the work to change your subconscious from that person. You've just through hard knocks, intellectualization of it, and saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to do that again. You don't, but you are relating energetically from that needy, begging, crying person, and he feels it. It's why you don't have the control, so to speak, and why this relationship is where it is. Because when you get this right, and you're no longer that person truly, not just through an intellectualization of it, but actually being it and not feeling like you feel right now, not feeling like if I do this, then I will never see him again. And knowing that that isn't the case and that this is what is the it factor in any male-female relationship, you will have it where you want it. And again, this doesn't have to be right now by doing it now. It's step by step where each woman is. And because you are not ready and because you don't know it to your core, you wouldn't want to do it. That will lead you nowhere and give him more of the same that he's had and it will do you no good. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just, you know, if I don't, if I get to a place where I don't care about the outcome with him because I'm enough on my own, let's say, and I've got a pretty good life on my own. But if I get to a place where I don't care about the outcome, I'm not sure that I would want to reestablish the relationship with him. So I don't, I don't really want to get to that place where I don't give a damn anymore. Maddie, it's not about not giving a damn. No, it's not black or white. It's you knowing how you do the mechanics of this to keep the car on the road how you want it. It's not not caring. It's not no longer wanting it. It's feeling so whole, so great, having self-love to a point because your subconscious isn't there. This may sound like voodoo. I don't know. But when we get this and you change that and you know that this is by design and an approach that will work, it's not like you don't want the outcome. You do. And that's okay. It's mindfulness, not just doing what your emotions tell you to do and your intellect is telling you to do. No, it's really having an approach, a step-by-step -step knowledge that this is what will lead me to get the results I want. And I'm staying 
right there that I want those results. It's not like I'm not going to care because if you don't care, you're not going to want it. And then we're not, there's no reason to even talk about it. You no longer want it anymore, correct? Correct. You wouldn't be here. No, you do want it. I do, but I will say that in the past, once I've given up on people, that I've been just done when I've reached that point where I'm just done, that's when they come back, but then it's too late. Maddie, are you understanding that's not where you are? And that's in no way are we trying to get you where you don't care. That's not what we're striving for. This is an approach, a systematic way, knowing what works with men and getting your subconscious to a place where you are not needy. Just because you're not needy, trying to get love, but you are love and you are able to accept it and give it from a place of wholeness, you still want the love and knowing that you have it and will have it along with what works with men, you get it. We are not striving for you to no longer want it. That's first of all, unrealistic. You do want it. Why would we strive for something that's not true? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just, I just, I do not freaking know what to do. In the past, when I don't know what to do, I just do nothing. If I don't know what to do, I don't call, I don't text, I just freeze and I just... Of course you do. That's fight or flight fear. I can give you the way. I also don't want to mess up, so I figure if I do nothing, at least I can't mess things up worse than they already are. Yes. Yep, first of all, they're not that messed up, okay? They're not. It's you changing you and your programming that will change everything and be the game changer here. It is not outside of you. It is not him that will make this work. It is you changing you. And that's the good news because you have control over that. So I've been doing a lot of work on attachment. And, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. Attachment and attachment style and trying to figure out why I behave the way I do and how my behavior impact. Well, me and also him, it still has not clicked. It's still not, it's still not, I, I don't need him. I have a life. I have, I have, you know, an income. I have a house. I have a, I have my friends. I have my hobby. The reality is I don't need him. Maddie, I want to stop you because you're just going into your intellect now. All that stuff about I've been working on attachment style and this and that. Then you just go back to I have a good life. I don't need him. Trying to convince yourself. You will never convince your subconscious in this way and change anything. You've done it for a couple of years. It doesn't work. If it worked, wouldn't be here. This is understanding men, but most importantly, you changing your subconscious so that you do not have any attachment issues that you're talking about or relating to his stuff in the way you're talking about. It hasn't worked and it likely won't. When it's not working, you do something different. And of course you don't need him in your life. You want him in your life. Normal, natural, being partnered, having love, someone loving you. It's the beauty of life and you deserve it. You absolutely deserve it. And he will be lucky to have it with you. You can do this, but you've got to change your way of looking at it and give over to doing something different so you get a different result. I understand, but I don't know what to do. You're here to find out what to do, correct? Correct. Yeah. And I'm going to give you that. But it's not going to be just in this one conversation, perhaps, because, yeah, I can give it to you, walk away, and that'll be that, and you won't make any changes. First, for me, it's do no harm. And you're at the very start, and this can be the first day of the rest of your beautiful, wonderful relationship with him that goes the distance. If you commit to changing you and going step by step with him and easing up on the, believe it or not, pressure that he feels he's under. That may make, he does. Well, he's able to verbalize that with me, but he's verbalized that with people 
in the past. He says, it's just a pressure. I don't know what to do. I don't want to break up with them. And it's just a pressure and I have to do it. Okay. So anyone who's listening who really knows my stuff knows that this eventually will be the lower approach if needed. But right now, you have got to quell things down and throw sand on this fire. And that is going to be done through you not leading it in the way that you've been leading it and the way you've been talking to him and the pressure he's felt under. But you are going to give him a lovely, beautiful relationship for a time and it will change him over time. But the most important thing to do that and continue it is you to change your subconscious programming. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's where we start. And it's totally resetting things, setting our GPS. That's why I call it my GPS system. It is setting our GPS and what we want and then doing these two things working on your subconscious programming so you feel love, you are love, you embody it, you your energy shows it, you're no longer leaking out the neediness where he does feel pressure. Because you likely think, when I relate to him, I show him I'm not putting up with the nonsense. I show him I'm all that in terms of life. I'm successful. I'm beautiful. I'm intelligent. I have humor. I have great hobbies. I have it all going on. And he should just see that and feel very lucky that he has me. Correct? Correct. It doesn't work like that because that's your intellectual knowledge of yourself. That's not energetically only with a love interest do you exude. Nobody else. Everybody else feels exactly that. You got it all going on. In other words, none of this is the case with anyone else in your life except a love interest. And in the past, that's been the case with other love interests. Is that right? Right. Yep. It's that simple. But not always. No, not always. That's the mm, je ne sais quoi of all of it. And again, if the desire on your part isn't there. That's one thing. And then it's, this likely comes in when you feel this pull towards a man, unlike other men. And that's because he embodies your primary love experience. Each person has their own unique experience of what love is. That's why one person can be attracted to somebody and somebody else won't be. And we, like animals, can ferret out who's going to give us that experience. Because initially, you weren't even interested in him. But it is that animal instinct kind of stuff that animals have, our human animal, that draws us to those folks who play out our love experience. Love is not what it is in the dictionary. It's not what everybody thinks that love is kind and it's beautiful and we are honest and faithful and this and that. No, each person has their own imprinted subconscious experience that runs on a program in each of us. And it's when we find that adult person who embodies that program, do we like, okay, now I'm in love. And it's like nothing else. But we want to get to what you do now, right from here, when he calls today. Wondering what I'm going to tell Maddie she needs to say to Andrew during this all-important phone call with him that will have him starting to feel differently about her and what she can do to guide him in a feminine, high-value way for Andrew to feel like he has to make her his one. In the rest of this episode, I explain the next steps to Maddie to, number one, tamp down her anxiety, and number two, what she needs to say to Andrew whether he wants to start up again or whether he doesn't so that she will 
still have a chance with him either way. That's right. Maddie is at a pivotal moment in her relationship, and she must know that whatever Andrew says to her now, she will get what she wants in the end if she does what I'm about to outline for success in each case scenario. And because I want you to get the results you desire in your romantic life, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this interesting coaching conversation with Maddie. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership only club of the Make You Wonder podcast, where you'll get over 150 episodes in full, all ad free, categorized by age and relationship status, plus all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. Unfiltered, never before public coaching conversations like this one, with all my advice and principles to have you succeeding in your romantic life. You'll also get my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series for you to focus on each and every week. It alone is valued at over $500 and is all yours as a member. Join monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a six or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me in a conversation like you just heard. You choose the date anytime during your 12 months and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve in your romantic life. Check it out at the 8020wonder.club and join us as that is the only way you'll be able to hear exactly what Maddie needs to do and say to Andrew whether he wants to continue on from tonight or he doesn't. I'm so sure that Maddie can have things go the distance with Andrew because I've helped so, so many women at a crossroads like Maddie get the results they want. So don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have the divine right results you desire or how to start dating in a way that guides a potential Mr. Right to do right by you. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. That's T H E 8020wonder.club. You and your love will be glad you did.